favorite memory is can't be broken down into one uh, specific memory, but uh, collectively it's uh, my family, my wife, my kids, grandkids. That I can't. Uh, everything else pales in comparison to the relationships I've had over time with my family. Watching kids grow up, grandkids grow up, seeing them get started in the world. It, it's so. Uh, I remember uh, one thing, uh, one little anecdote I can tell you that's uh, kind of cute. Um, I used to take your grandmother and the first two kids uh, to church. At the time, she was still religious, Roman Catholic, and I was not. So I would take them up to the church and uh, <laughs> uh, leave and go get a Sunday paper and come back and read it until she got out of, got out of church. Well, this was on Easter Sunday, a long time ago. Your father was maybe two or three, and I was, and my wife, Dale, had, had them all gussied up in all white clothing. And they were just cute as hell. Just your father had a little suit on, short pants, and Susie had a little frilly white dress, all white for you, sir. And they were just full of piss and vinegar. <laughs> but I said, I'm not going to let these kids get out of the house until I get some pictures. I still got those pictures. And you can just read. You can read their faces. They were just devilish, impish. They would clown every time I tried to take a picture. They were just raring to go. So anyway, when I took them up to the church, I said, you know, I'm not going to go get a Sunday paper. Today. I'm going to hang around because I don't think my wife's going to be in there that long with these kids. Sure enough, maybe 10 minutes later, out she comes. She's got Billy in her arms, Susie by the hand. She could walk. So she was, uh, I guess, well, Susie was a year older than your father. And uh, her hat's on cockeyed. She looked like she'd been in a fight. And I said, what happened? And she said, oh my God, you'll never believe it. There was a lady sitting in front of us. And she had, back in those days, it was very popular with women to have these, basically, stuffed animals around their neck, like a fox yeah. or something like that. Well, they're sitting there and they're just full of the devil. And they see that head of that fox and they started barking at <laughs> <laughs> and she said, I tried to shut them up, but they wouldn't shut up. And it just got to the point where the old lady turned around and looked and, you know, gave her a dirty look. She said, I just couldn't, I couldn't control them. Everybody was looking at us because they go, woof, woof, woof. <laughs> As your father and your Aunt Susan. And uh, out they came. So that was the end of, that's a, a very favorite memory. Everything. Everything. I can't imagine life without my family. I can't. Uh, there's a depth of uh, love that comes with uh, uh, with uh, having children and all. It's just in my life's experience is unique. There's nothing compares to it. Not a big car. Not a big house. Not a, you know. Not a big career. You know, which I thought was terribly important when I started out. Because, like I say, that's a, at least when I was coming along, perhaps it's different today, but uh, that was the uh, standard measure of success. You know, if you went to school, you got out, got a good job, and uh, made a lot of money. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, in, it's not, it's not the most important thing in life. The most important thing is the love of the people around you. And, uh, it's 
spend more time with my family and less time with my job. When I was younger, I used to work, 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 work. You know, got to get ahead. You know, got to be successful. Successful in quotes. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Like I, like I said earlier, I, I don't think there's ever been a person. Maybe there has been, but certainly not me. But on my deathbed, I, I'd say, "Damn, I wish I spent more time on my job <laughs> and less on my family." It doesn't work that way. You realize that a lot of the values that you had as a youngster came from the culture. And the culture says, be rich and famous and you're successful. That's bullshit. <laughs> Just is. You're successful if, uh, you know, if you have a loving family and your kids grow up to be good people, good, kind people. And that's true. All of, all of you guys, you're all good people, and that's uh, that's a great joy in life. It is. There's not a, not another lot like it for me. I'm not I'm not, uh, I'm not spiritual. Uh, a lot of people get it from makes a relationship with a superior being, you know, mm -hmm. with God, and so I don't. Uh, I don't have that. I, I, family to me is that relationship. I mean, if they're, I just, uh, I gave up on that a long time ago, trying to figure out the ultimate nature of reality. When I was younger, I used to go to church every Sunday, sang in the church choir. I was very religious. But as I've gotten older, I, uh, I think it's safe to say I'm I don't want to get into a debate where I agnosticism versus atheism, but that's the side of the spectrum I'm on when it comes to spirituality. Yeah. I just, uh, I don't know. You know, when you think about it, where did I come from? I was an egg in my mother's womb. And then some sperm found that egg and created me. I, I, I never said, you know, like ordering pizza, uh, oh, I want to go to Earth. <laughs> da, 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 da. In other words, I, I, I had no choice. No. Just like the kid that uh, in Vietnam that got killed by napalm, they had no choice. You know, I'm lucky that I was born here. And it's all pure luck. And to say that I understand how, how I really got here, I understand the mechanics of it, the biology of it. Mm -hmm. But that's not the understanding, you know, in, in a fundamental way. Yeah. That, that's just uh, uh, not. And uh, and the universe, I, I took a course a, a couple of years ago in uh, cosmology. A not too bright friend of mine said, I never knew you were interested in makeup. I said, hey, you <laughs> moron. <laughs> It's cosmetology. Yeah. Cosmology is a study of the universe. Anyway, I had a really good professor. I took it at a local college where I live. Because, uh, you know, when you get old, you have time on your hands and your brain starts to atrophy. So go back to college and learn some stuff. This guy had, had a PhD in physics and really, really bright guy. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's an astounding, it's just like, you know, being born, but when you learn about the cosmos, it's mind-boggling. You know, where did all this come from, you know? And I, and I, I find it interesting and fun to learn about this stuff, but to say that I have answers about the ultimate nature, you know, metaphysical, basic metaphysical questions, yeah. uh, I don't. And anybody that says they do, including the Pope and all, all of the spiritual people in the world, I just think they're kidding themselves, personally. So I'm not telling them not to have those beliefs, because yeah. I, I am somewhat of a libertarian. Uh, I like the idea of freedom of thought, speech, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think, because for years, I think the church has encouraged Certain churches, I mean, you know, why, 
What's the history of anti-Semitism in Europe? Well, I, I think in no small part uh, it plays or the, the Catholic Church has some owning up to do and some guilt. Uh, because they, they're the ones that claim for years and years and years that the Jews killed Jesus. And uh, that's a cult. Uh, I, I worked with a guy who was in the, uh, well, he was in the German army, the Wehrmacht. His name was Helmut Weiss. <laughs> and he was, a, he was actually Austrian, but they're German. So was Hitler, actually. He was born in Austria. Uh, and I asked him, I said, was, was the uh, anti-Semitism uniquely a German phenomenon? You know, because of the, what happened during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. He just shook his head and smiled and said, no. <laughs> he said, it was all over Europe. And I've sub subsequently done some reading. And, I mean, there were programs in the Soviet Union and Poland and, and East. Uh, Jews had a rough time with it in a lot of places, mm -hmm. in the Balkans. Uh, so it was a phenomenon that was aided and abetted and I believe started, basically by the church. Uh, church is, is not a... I'd say one, one of the most interesting things that, uh, is that, you know, we've always assumed, I think Einstein proved this, that, you know, when light goes, say, from the sun past a, a body that has gravity, the light actually gets bent. Mm -hmm. You can show that. And Einstein said, no, that's not the reason. I think I might be getting this wrong. Check my facts. The reason why uh, you're not, the light is getting bent is not the gravity of, say, Mars or, you know, if you're over here with the receptor and the sun is here and Mars is here, when the light goes, they can show. Well, they did it with Mercury, that's what it was, yeah. The study of Mercury. And they can show that the light actually gets bent. So they figure, well, the gravity, the pull of, of Mercury is, and Einstein's equations predicted the exact, the exact amount of how much that light would be moved, I guess, or whatever. I'm probably butchering an argument, but um, his theory was that where that mass called Mars sits in space, it bends space. It is actually a dead. Now that's a hard concept to grasp. Yeah. How do you how do you put divots in space, which is essentially nothing? You know. But anyway, that, that I think that was the way the Professor explained it. Yeah. He said if you if you just look at a map of space with the objects removed, it wouldn't be flat like that. It would be like that. Right. And that's I don't know. That's uh, it's hard to get your head around you. The only way Einstein or whoever decided about that uh, theory was through mathematics. A lot, of, a lot of science, when you get at that level, mm -hmm. is not intuitive. I mean, you know, how in the world can you bend nothingness? <laughs> and then, uh, and lately too, you know, for years they've never been able to capture a wave, or just recently, within the last couple of years, of gravity. We know it exists, because when you fall, but uh, I think they've, they've actually been able to measure something that, well, does that declare the, the idea of the bent space mm -hmm. irrelevant, or maybe the two exist, coexist, I don't know. Some of that, some of that stuff is, can really make your head hurt when you start to think about it. Yeah. But yeah, it's... Uh, what do you, like, what do you mean they captured a wave of gravity? Yeah. 
Yeah, they, like I say, they know gravity exists, but I think recently somebody somewhere, some group of scientists, they actually... Am I confusing this with... What was that guard part, God particle? What the heck was that all about? That Scotch professor. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure that's the same. But anyway, somewhere I learned in those classes that one of the reasons why light seemingly gets bent is because space is curved around the object. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are dips in space and the fabric of space. So when the light goes through it, the light moves according to that dip. And it's not gravity that's doing it, it's the shape of space. Uh, but yeah, recently they've actually, I think, found and measured, uh, you know, like you can do with light or sound, a wave that, uh, that's gravity, I think. I don't think in the past they were able to do The first name, William, is uh, from my great uncle. Everybody called him Uncle Will. He was actually my father's uncle. Uh, he was my father's father's brother. And uh, my dad well, really liked that. That's why I got the name, I'm sure. Uh, everybody that knew him liked him. He was, uh, he was just a real fine human being, gentleman, hard worker. He used to dig, uh, I was back before a lot of automated equipment, you know, like bulldozers. And he used to uh, dig cellars for houses by hand. And he had a team of horses and a, a wagon. And they would, he'd throw the dirt on the on the wagon and the horses would haul. I remember him because he, I, I, I knew him. He was, he, he was born around, he, around the time of the Civil War. He lived to be about 90. He died in 1950, 51. So his, that puts his birth around 1860. And uh, I was just a young kid because I, I couldn't have been any more than nine or 10. Mm -hmm. And I used to go down to his house and just, we'd talk. That <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he, he, uh, he loved people, he loved children. He never told me, I can't talk to you today, I don't have time. He always had time to talk to you. He was a really good man. Yeah, had a lot of hardship in his life. But anyway, he dug cellars for a living. That's hard work. With a, with a shovel and a team of horses and a, and a wagon. <laughs> and I remember when, uh, I remember the big old barn he had out in the back of his house. Probably the last one in town. Because the town started changing when I was a kid. A lot of people got, a lot of people started moving out from New York City. Mm -hmm. It was, suburb it became suburbanized. But when I was little, it was small town America. He was probably the last person to do that kind of work. He had chickens, and probably the last chickens, because that got outlawed too, you know, as the place becomes suburbanized, they keep changing the law, but they, because he had already had chickens and horses, they let him keep them, uh, called grandfather and men. And he had a goat, big old billy goat, who stood. He didn't like me. He scared the heck out. He, that goat, get, he'd see me he'd come after me. <laughs> and he had a rooster in the chicken yard. That rooster was very, very protective of his hens. <laughs> yeah. I remember back, in, we lived on near, right near the water. And everybody had tons of clam shells and oyster shells. And uh, in the chicken yard, was all shell, oyster shells because they used to peck at it and that's how they got the calcium, which they needed a lot, you know, for the yeah. shell of the egg that they laid. But yeah, we, we always had fresh eggs. Uh, 
free range eggs. And he had the old billy goat. He had a big garden. And he had the barn with those great big horses. They look like those uh, things in the Budweiser commercials. Uh, they were work horses, you know, they had to be big and strong because they pulled the wagon full of dirt. But yeah, he, uh, he was a, a gentle, sweet human being. Worked hard all his life. And uh, smoked an old corn cob pipe. Mm -hmm. You walk in, you know, you knock on the door, come in. And you walk in, sometimes you couldn't even see him. This little billows of smoke around him. <laughs> he, he spoke Granger pipe tobacco. So, needless to say, when I got to be a kid, a teenager, and you know, experimenting with smoking, I got a corn cob pipe and some Granger pipes. <laughs> like to kill me. <laughs> I got sick as a dog. But yeah, I wanted to be like Uncle Will, so I smoke a pipe and smoke Granger. But yeah, he was, a, he was a good man, a very good man. And how was he related to you? He was my great uncle. He was my father's uncle. Okay. Yeah. That was William Combs? Yeah, everybody called him Uncle Will. Uncle Will. Yeah. And he was, he was a gentle soul, a hard working man. Now, Alexander Combs, I know about him, but I never met him because he was deceased before I made this. He, uh, he used to have a great big schooner. My father was on it. My father said when he was 10, he couldn't put his arms around the mast at the base. That's a, it was over 100 feet, which was a very big boat in wow. those days. And uh, he also was a farmer. There are no farms there now. That's all. That's all gone. But uh, he owned a lot of property and uh, he used to run a schooner from New York. We lived on the South Shore of Long Island, New York. And he would, uh, what did he carry down there? Bricks to Norfolk. Mm -hmm. And he'd come back with a load of tobacco on his, on his shipping business. Yeah. And uh, when the county wanted to cut a road through that area where we lived. He donated the land to the county. And uh, so that's why it's called, to this day, Combs Avenue. And my dad was born and raised there and I was raised on Combs Avenue. Uncle Will lived on Combs Avenue. Most all the Combses lived on Combs Avenue. <laughs> yeah. But the only thing I know, that know about it, I know what he looked like because we have a picture of him. Yeah. He's a great big guy. He was, you know, six four or five, which was a giant in those days. Wow! And he had a big beard <laughs> in the picture. Yeah, he was. Uh, he was quite successful as a businessman, apparently. Uh, Do you know where the Combs name originates? In England. Yeah. Um, I was over there. You know, your father lived over there for a few years. And uh, he said, I want to take you and mom on a day trip to Cambridge because it's a really neat place. What's where Cambridge University is. It's a real old town. In the old part of town, the streets are real narrow. It's medieval. And uh, so up we went. He said, you know, the last time I went, he said, I'm not 100% sure of this, but we were coming back to where he lived, which is, uh, well, that doesn't make sense, but it, name of the town was Woodbridge. And he said, I think out of the corner of my eye, I saw a little, over there they have these small road signs, you know, rectangular signs, and they have the town name mm -hmm. with the, the little thing of a head of an arrow on it. Yeah. And he said, I'm almost sure I saw one that said C-O-M-B-S. So he said, when I get in that area on the way home, I'm going to go real slow, see if I, sure enough, you found it. Cool. And it's probably where uh, my father's uh, family was from. Makes sense. We didn't, I'd love to go back and kind of check in the records and stuff and see if that's where we were. Yeah, there were two towns. One was called Combsford. Combs with F-O-R-D on the end of it. And then there was the town of Combs. 
and uh, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was like a uh, walk stepping back in time. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. We uh, <laughs> tell you a cute story. My, uh, we stopped to get something to eat and drink in a little pub in Combs. Over there they say Coombs. And uh, mommy, uh, your grandmother, Dale, said, uh, let's see if we can find another Combs. You know, we'll go visit them and see if they have any old Bibles. They kept yeah. records of births and marriages and deaths and old Bibles. And let's see if he knows any history about uh, Pop's family. And, because uh, they came to this country in the 1600s. Yeah. My, my, yeah, they've been here forever. Um, this is like a hundred years before this was a country. Mm -hmm. they were, the Combses, there were half a dozen families that settled that area. And, uh, that area being Long Island, New York area. And, uh, they, they were overwhelmingly Dutch, because the Dutch were the first ones in there. Mm -hmm. Because they, they, uh, they, uh, well, New York, uh, New York it was originally called, before the Brits came, was called New Amsterdam. Because they were Dutch settlers. And like yeah. I said, my Uncle Will's wife was a, was a Dutch descent. A lot of Dutch people have prefix of their last name is Van. Mm -hmm. her, her name was Van Pelt, her last name. But, um, yeah, we, <laughs> Mommy said to Billy, said, ask the bartender for a phone book and see if there are any other Combses in here. Yeah. And uh, so he said, okay, and he gave the book to your grandmother. And she's looking through it. And she finds, she gets all excited, oh, look here, Billy, mm -hmm. there's a Combs in the book. And uh, so he, he, she gave it to him, and he looks at it and he starts laughing. It was him. Yeah. He was the only Combs in the book. Right. Yeah. So they all got chased out of England or something. <laughs> they, they got a town named Combs, but they don't have any people. <laughs> your, your father was the only Combs in the book. That's funny. Yeah. That was kind of funny. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's still... Uh, Houses over there still have thatched rooms on them. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a delightful area. The larger area is called East Anglia. It's very pretty. And they're very, uh, they're very, very uh, conscious of their history. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't cut a tree down in New York without permission. They don't allow it. And when they, they don't knock buildings down, they fix them up. Yeah. You can win a pub and it's five, six hundred years old, you know, mm -hmm. but it's in perfect condition. I like that personally. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that was Alex. He was a very successful uh, shipping guy and farmer, apparently. Uh, oh, by far and away, my family. Absolutely. Uh, then that's the greatest thing. I've been extremely lucky. Your uh, grandmother was the finest person I've ever known. And she did one hell of a job raising five monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> they all, all five of them have really, they're good people. They're kind, they're thoughtful. Uh, your dad, and, you know, your aunts. Uh, Grandma was, she was, uh, she was a lot like Uncle Will, you know, very level-headed. Uh, the Germans, and my mother, by the way, I didn't say anything about her. Uh, my father's people were English. My mother was off the boat German. Mm -hmm. She uh, came here in 1923 when the economy in Germany was in the tank mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which was the reparations that the Peace of Versailles that ended World War One put on the Germans. Right. I mean, here they are devastated, and then they got to pay all these payments, and the economy just, you know, that's why. That's why a lot of Germans emigrated to this country. 
because they couldn't find work. And uh, yeah, so yeah, she was born and raised on a farm in Bavaria. And there were 12 kids, nine boys and three girls. Wow. And uh, all but one of them came here. Uh, he came over here actually, and then he didn't decide he wanted to go back to Germany. And his, his, he's, uh, he's long gone, of course. My Uncle Wolfgang, I met him. He was a World War I vet, fought with the, the Germans in mm. World War I. I had two, uh, my Uncle Carl, who's another one of my mother's brothers. And he did come here, and I knew him. He was a character. And uh, the youngest one of the 12, named Fred, and he came here and got drafted. And so he went into Normandy, and he was in the first wave of troops that went into North. Mm -hmm. So I had the Germans who fought the American. He was in the uh, combat infantry. He fought on the American side, and then two of his uh, brothers fought on the German side. Wow. And uh, in World War One, and uh, I kind of mixed things up. There. I had a uh, Carl and Wolfgang. They were in World War I, Uncle Fred was World War II. But one of my father's brothers was on the American Army in World War I. Mm -hmm. He's buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Well, yeah, Uncle Myron, he was a pisser. <laughs> he, was, he and my father really liked each other. He'd come up to Long Island. He lived in Alexandria, Virginia. He'd come up to Long Island, especially if his wife wasn't with him. And, uh, the two of them would they'd sit up till two or three o'clock in the morning telling stories about when they were kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, uh, he was a, he was an interesting guy. But yeah, I had uh, Uncle um, Fred was in World War Two, and uh, had a big party for him when he came home, and he had. Had I guess he swapped with Germans or wherever we go, but he had a whole great big bag full of uh, German medals, and he gave my brother he gave me an iron cross. I don't know where it is. I lost it. Uh, yeah, and he had a Luger too. I wanted that Luger. Uh, I was over five or six years old, and now. Uh, session on such an easy question. <laughs> uh, I think that the main meaning for me is in interpersonal relationships. Without them, I, don't, I think life would be really sterile. You know, I'm just speaking for myself. Yeah. Some people can find great meaning in nuclear physics. And I, I'm, I'm sure you can find enjoyment and stuff like that, but uh, given a, say, a famous career in academia or writing or you know, absent my family, wouldn't have much meaning for me. I'm not, not making that a blanket statement for all humanity, but yeah. for me, I, it, it would, life wouldn't have had much meaning had I been, say, a famous basketball player if I had if that was not in the context of a loving family so I guess if I had to single out the, the most important element that it's given my life meaning it would, it would be my marriage and my kids and grandkids for that yeah, there's no doubt about that in my mind I just uh, it makes sense out of a, a universe which is beyond cognition, so far as I'm concerned. I, you know, I, I know a little bit about, not too much. I took a couple of courses in, you know, cosmology and a lot of math, a lot of science, and, and a lot of that. I mean, it's fascinating stuff. 
to mm -hmm. learn about you know how the universe really works as opposed to believing a lot of mythology that you get as a youngster in Sunday school. Yeah. And that truly is mythology. I mean, science is a much more, uh, seems to be, reasonable way to pursue truth. Mm -hmm. And a pursuit of truth has its, I mean, it's kind of like, aha moments, you know, and it's pleasant mm -hmm. to learn about stuff. But like I say, if, had I had all of that, uh, absent, fan, absent my family, I don't think life would have had a great deal of meaning. Like I say, I'm speaking for myself, because so I'm sure there are a lot of people that never had a family that had very meaningful lives, in, you know, in, in their terms, uh, through other ways, you know, great career, a lot of money, a lot of prestige, but not me, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work with me, for sure. And, uh, I do find, uh, you know, reading about nature and uh, the cosmos. And it, it is fascinating. It is fascinating. I don't mean to demean that kind of knowledge. But it, uh, it would be, I think, for a meaningful life for me, it would be perhaps a necessary but not sufficient condition. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean, I'm yeah. sure you know what I'm saying. Uh, that's about the best I can do. And that's a pretty brief answer to it. Yeah. A very big question. I could write a book on that. Well, since we have the camera rolling, like, is there anything you want to say? Uh, I'm glad to be here. And by here, I mean Arizona and alive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost, I'll be 80 in a couple of days. And uh, if you would have asked me 20, 30 years ago if I'd ever see 80, I said, no. <laughs> Never make it that long. Uh, so I'm, you know, I can't complain about the quality of life, length of life, uh, who I've shared this life with. That's like I say, that's been the, the main love and meaning for me. Yeah. I've. Uh, I've hooked up on this journey with some incredible people. <laughs> and that's what makes it all worthwhile. There's, uh, it, for me, there's just, there's no, there's no uh, substitute for the love of a child, you know? And I always said that even before I had children, but I never really, until you experience it, you don't really feel it in your heart and gut. Yeah. Yeah. But I, and like I say, I'm just speaking for myself because I'm sure there are a lot of people that uh, never had kids and live very fruitful lives. I, I don't mean to, I don't mean to be exclusive for sure. in that definition. You know? There's a lot of ways I so people that write, I've often been a little bit jealous about uh, great singers. That's I, 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 that to me would be a wonderful thing to be uh, be able to sing at the La Scala mm -hmm. in Milan mm -hmm. uh, as a tenor, which I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great thrill. As I, I love music. And, uh, yeah. But. Uh, it's different. It's different than the love you have for a child. There's just no, no comparison. Mm -hmm. None.